I'm the most unstoppable player in the league. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Bieber. We're going to be here breaking down the action from Wednesday's nine games, lots of information, a bit of a, a comprehensive injury review as well in today's uh uh, with today's uh, games, uh, just going through a few things that I think may or may not be happening. Uh, I think that might be uh, interesting for a lot of you guys there as well. And then previewing Thursday's six-game slate in the NBA, Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. We will start with... Monstrous line of the night. The monstrous line of the night. It goes to James Harden of the Houston Rockets. Just another ludicrous performance from Harden. 57 points against the Grizzlies. In an overtime loss, he's had... Uh, it's not even his highest scoring game of the season. He's had a 61-pointer. In fact, this is this is the amazing part. This is his second 57-point game against the Grizzlies. 57 points, 9 triples, 7 rebounds, 8 assists, 2 steals, 2 blocks, 18 of 39 from the field, hit all 12 of his free throws. He remains the number one fantasy player for the season. He's been a little bit off recently, the number two guy over the last month, but this was a huge, huge night, averaging 38, sorry, 36, 6.5, and 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 7.5, over two steals, almost five triples, almost a block on 44 and 88% from the field and from the line. Ridiculous numbers from Harden. I've talked about them enough. This feels like it's about his 20th monstrous line of the night and uh, continues to do it even when it looks like the numbers might start to wane with his wrist and neck uh, becoming a problem. But huge from Jimmy Harden in this one. Waiver wire line of the night. The waiver wire line of the night goes to Dan Green of the Toronto Raptors, big minutes for Green in the overtime victory against the Thunder, 36 of them uh, with Kyle Lowry out, 17 points, 5 triples, 5 rebounds, 6 assists for Danny Green. A surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. He had 2 steals as well, 6 of 10 from the field, now his numbers haven't been fantastic, but he still remains the 114th ranked player over the course of the season. And that's on the back of just solid production in most categories and nothing spectacularly good. In fact, the only categories that he's a positive for this season are his, are his threes, hitting 2.4 a game, and his free throws, where he's only marginally a positive because he takes so few of them. Everything else is a negative, but he's you know, close to average in blocks, close to average in steals, and you're marginally below average in rebounds and assists. Um, you know, below average in points, but still right there, probably more of a roto guy than a head-to-head guy, just because of his ability to contribute in all those categories. Not a must-roster guy, more of a stream player, and we've seen his minutes dip over the last couple of months as well, but a nice game here in the head-to-head playoffs from Danny Green to uh, to get you that nice little boost that everyone is looking for at this point in the season, of course. All right, now, uh, the next ga- the next award of the day is the Deep Leaguer of the Night, and that is Big Shaq Harrison. Big Shaq! He had 18 points with a three, six rebounds, zero assists. How many steals? Two plus two is four. Minus one, that's three. Quick maths. Actually, it wasn't three. It was four. So Big Shaq, he didn't need to minus that one off there. He started in place of Otto Porter. Porter, it looks like he's going to be out a decent amount of time here. Porter did say, oh, you guys think I'm missing the season. That's ridiculous. Calm down, Otto. You are going to miss some time here. Maybe he does return at some stage this season, but uh, it's it, you're going to have at least a little bit of time here for Big Shaq. He played 39 minutes in this one, 18 and 6 with four steals, as I mentioned. You can't rely upon the level of usage, uh, the 18 points, but the steals, they'll come. You normally will get some assists out of Big Shaq. And over the last month, he's 171st ranked player, but it's all coming down to these steal numbers. Per 36 minutes for steals this season, he's at 2.4. He could be playing 31 or 32 minutes a night, and you could get two steals a game here for Big Shaq Harrison. And of course, that's going to be quite a useful number. Um, Short-term streamer, excellent value. If 16 team leaguers, 
you look at him as not not a must roster guy, but pretty close. And according to Yahoo at the moment, who had a whole bunch of issues with their statuses today, uh, his uh, roster percentage is at this point at zero. So he is around in your 16s and 18s and 20 teamers. And you might even have use for Big Shaq in 14 teamers and even 12 team leagues with the current injury situation with Otto Porter out. And of course, Zach Levine missing today's game as well. So value abounding for Big Shaq Harrison, and he gets the deep leaguer of the night. We are something we do have to mention to you guys. New new podcast app that's out called Himalaya, locked on uh, podcast network in a partnership with Himalaya at the moment. So make sure you are checking out the app Himalaya, a great way for you to check out podcasts on your phone. So the app is Himalaya. Download that, and you can check out this podcast and the rest of the locked on podcast network shows across that app. Young gun of the night. The young gun of the night is Big Shaq's teammate, and that is Larry Markinen of the Chicago Bulls. 38 minutes in the overtime victory, 32 and 13 with five threes, five assists and a block. Just huge usage with Zach Levine out. Uh, he had uh, 12 of 21 from the field, only three free throws. We talked about how insanely good he was in February, how insanely bad he's been in March. But the last two games have been getting that back on track. Uh, most importantly, getting some blocks in those games, getting the field goal percentage up, getting the field goal attempts up as well. And you've got to think that some of that's to do with the absence of Porter and the absence uh, of Levine in this game. The 51st ranked player over the course of the season. I worry about what his absolute ceiling is because of his inability to generate assist steals and blocks. Uh, like the finish Ryan Anderson type of a guy, or peak you know, that peak Ryan Anderson, who was that top 50, top 30 type of guy for a stretch of time. Maybe I'm misremembering uh, Ryan Anderson's peak. I'm going to look that up while we uh, while we talk about um, uh, while we talk about Larry Markin and his numbers. It's the lack of assist, steals, and blocks, which does put I think a capper on what he can do. But if he had a season where he averaged 21 or 22 points, 10 or 11 rebounds, and did it on pretty good percentages, I think you'd be uh, okay with that. On the Ryan Anderson, he had a season where he was the 36th ranked player and a season where he was the 47th ranked player. So Markin's not quite at that level yet. He can get to it. He can probably exceed it and maybe get to the top 30, but getting to top 20, top 15, it might be a little bit of a stretch for big Larry Markinen. The dud of the night is Julius Randle. Of the New Orleans Pelicans, only 22 minutes for Randall. He got into foul trouble. They got their asses kicked by the Magic. He shot poorly. Just an all-round disaster for Randall. 6-3-2 with a triple zero and one of nine from the field. He was surprisingly four of five from the line. He's the 55th ranked player this season. The numbers have dipped a little bit for him, especially the efficiency over the last month down at 48% from the field, and that's dropped him to be the 77th ranked player there, even without uh, Anthony Davis and his minutes going up to 34 a game. It's the drop in efficiency and the 68% from the free throw line that has hampered that overall number. Uh, where he lands in the offseason is going to be really, really curious. I think that if he remains in New Orleans and Davis is traded, that he might be at risk of being overdrafted. People might look at him as a top 30 guy where he has a little bit of the Larry Markinens about him. The lack of steals and blocks does limit him. But on the flip side, he can uh, he can get assists, whereas he doesn't hit threes like Markinen, although that has improved for Randall this season. So strong from him most of this year. You're not dropping him after this performance. But really, um, yeah, not, not a great one and an inopportune time of the season. The plus minus goats, ravishing Rick Rubio. He's your plus minus best, best net rating guy of the day, plus 78.6, while the worst went to Tim Frazier, negative 119.2. This guy keeps bouncing around team after team after team. He continues to be bad team after team after team, but continues to get jobs and minutes. I don't really um, don't really understand it, but it keeps happening, and that's where we're at with Tim Frazier. Obviously not an ad really anywhere outside of a 30-team league at this point. Let's talk some injury news. Uh, Nikola Mirotic suffered a broken thumb. Um, that that's a concern. Obviously, the initial report from Shams was he missed two to four weeks, and then Mike Budenholzer came out. I don't know where that report came from. Well, it came from Shams. Uh, I expect him back sooner than that. If he's got a broken thumb, he won't be back sooner than that. And I think we should feel relatively confident. Well, I've been mentioning that he's a drop anyway because of how he'd been playing, and you'd look at him as a stream guy. Uh, now he's a pretty clear drop. I just don't see with that sort of an injury to someone's hand how he comes back sooner than two weeks. The regular season has three weeks left. I'd be absolutely stunned to see Miritich back uh, at any time before that final week of the season. 
Avery Bradley's going to be reevaluated in a week with a leg issue in Memphis. Don't think we're seeing him again this season. He's a pretty clear drop. Otto Porter, again, I mentioned him a little bit earlier, how Porter was saying, oh, no, I'll be back before the season. I, I don't really see there being any need for him to come back. All these guys, and Miritich is a drop, Bradley's a drop, Porter's a better player than both of those guys. But if you have to make that decision because you need to survive this week, then he's a drop. That's where we're at with this point in the season. That's the case with a lot of these guys. Now, Maxi Kleber missed Wednesday's game with a wrist issue. I'd be pretty surprised if he played on Thursday. We don't have notice of that at this point. Uh, a couple of other Memphis guys, Triple J, Jaron Jackson Jr. and Kyle Anderson, I feel pretty good about thinking they're not going to be back for meaningful playing time this season. Nothing official on either of those guys. But I think that they... The reason you hold out some hope is they ruled CJ Miles out for the season. They ruled Dylan Brooks out for the season. They haven't done it for Jackson or for Anderson. So I guess they're having hope that they come back. But at this point, we've got to think that they are two weeks at least away from returning. So their value is pretty done. Same with Drew Holiday and Etwan Moore. I don't think we'd expect either of those guys back within the next 10 days. Uh, and they could be drops. And it's hard, It's the hardest decision there with Drew Holiday, of course, as a top 20 player. But I really don't think that he's going to be coming back uh, at any point in the next 10 days, which pretty much rules him out of head-to-head -head playoffs in fantasy leagues. Each one more was just a deeper league guy anyway. Some other injury catch-ups. Uh, Bob Cuff and Jeff Teague in Minnesota. Teague and Covington, I wouldn't expect them the rest of this week. The Wolves, again, they haven't ruled Covington out for the season, but we're getting really close to that. I think that these guys are probably close to drops. Uh, Frank Nilakina with his groin issue, um, looks like he'll be back at the end of the week, so that's a positive. He's not going to do anything in that time, so that's a negative. For the Suns, Kelly Oubre, Tyler Johnson, and TJ Warren. The TJ Warren situation continues to be in a league filled with confusing situations, the most confusing. confusing. Remember when he was out with a mystery head injury for about three months last season, even though it wasn't a concussion? Now he's got ankle soreness, which has kept him out for the last two months. I don't think there's any need to be holding on to TJ Warren, though most of you would have dropped him already. I worry about Tyler Johnson, who's missed the last two games with a knee injury. Um, he's dealt with knee problems in the past. I think that he is going to miss, I'd probably think, the rest of the head-to-head -head playoffs, or at least the next 10 days. And Kelly Oubre has missed the last couple. I feel more confident about Oubre returning. Uh, with Johnson, though, I don't think we're going to see him back in that time frame. CJ McCollum, Damian Lillard said that he is expecting McCollum not to be here for the rest of the regular season. This popolitis, I think I've pronounced that correctly, uh, knee strain is what kept Kevin Garnett out of the 2009 end of the regular season and the playoffs. Now, his injury is not quite as bad as, uh, as Kev's, but they said they'd reevaluate CJ in a week. That doesn't mean he's back in a week. I think that we can feel pretty good, again, about seeing him out for the next two weeks. And then today, a couple of injuries. Aaron Baines suffered a grade two ankle sprain. That's almost assuredly going to wipe him out of the rest of the regular season, giving someone like Vanilla Tice and Shemi Ojale a boost. But just for those deeper leagues, Baines with a grade two, that's, it's going to be 20 days, 15 to 20 days, I would expect, uh, recovery there. Kevin Love banged heads with Eric Bledsoe at the end of the first half of the Cavs win over the Bucks today. He returned to start the second half after the halftime, which is weird to me. And then about two minutes into that half left and never returned, and we haven't heard anything further. Love has a history of concussion issues. Uh, it seems like a, maybe a delayed response here that they would have checked him definitely at halftime. He came back out, and you'd think that the lights screwed him up. Um, and then that, so that, to me, is making me think concussion. With a lot of these guys, yeah, with Love, I think he's missing time here. And again, I wouldn't be stunned if, if he's out for the next two weeks. But the way that he is playing and the way that his presence enables these other guys to play better. The Cavs want him out there. He wants to be out there. They are committed to seeing what they can build around him. And I like that approach that they're having with him. But in the rest of this week for Kevin Lover, I don't think we're seeing him. So if you're in your grand final matchup this week, I don't think he's back this week with his concussion. But again, nothing's official there. And he could come back. But it was a weird scenario to see him re-enter the game, start the second half, and then uh, not and then go back to the locker room after two minutes and not come back. So that is a little bit of a concern there with Kevin Love and his head and history of concussion issues. A couple of other injuries or issues. Anthony Davis was talked about how he had no more back-to-backs this season, so we'd see if the Pelicans play him the rest of the year. He missed today's game with a personal issue. His daughter was sick. Now, I am absolutely not coming out here and saying that this is a fake injury, and we hope that his daughter is fine. But I wouldn't be surprised if both he and the Pelicans say, 
Just take all the time you want to be with your sick daughter to help him re- help her recover. Again, in no way is this a fake situation. I do not believe that at all. But I also believe that there were, and when you just see these little words come out, he's gone home to be with his daughter. There is no timetable for his return. That means he is in no way, shape or form a lock to get back for the next game for this Pelicans team. And you would think that the chances of him not playing again in the next week are really high. Trevor Ariza suffered a groin strain for the Wizards today. He didn't return. I think it's highly unlikely he plays on Thursday in the back-to-back. Troy Brown started the second half. Now, no word on whether this is a regular season ender for Ariza. You would think that his minutes will drop a little bit and he'll miss some time. He was a fringe 12-team league guy anyway, so he's a clear drop in those scenarios. And in 14-teamers, if he's not going to play again this week, which I think is a real possibility, you move on. Troy Brown has been okay, but far from a must-add standard league type of a player. Let's now move on to these games and try and uh, and try and break them down in uh, in a bit more detail the nine games that we did have across the NBA on uh, on Wednesday the first one of these games we look at is the uh, the Utah Jazz I think I don't know why that's the first game that's come up on my list I don't think that's uh, correct but uh, let's uh, let's just reassess that because I'm pretty sure that's not the first one that I wanted to look at turns out I was right and it wasn't the Jazz game I wanted to look at first it was the Milwaukee Bucks losing to the Cleveland Cavaliers the Cavs win 107-102 no George Hill no Sterling Brown no Nick Miritich no Yanni Antetokounmpo no Malcolm Brogdon so a really weird rotation for Milwaukee Brook Lopez excellent again 19-4 and 4 with 3 threes and 2 blocks Chrissy Middleton and Eric Bledsoe both stepping up 26 and 12 for Middleton 24 8 and 8 with 2 steals for Bledsoe while Patty Connaughton big minutes again for Pat 34 minutes, 11, 3, and 4 with two steals. Now, he is the one player in the NBA that I get the most confused as to what team he is on. I keep thinking he's on the Blazers. I guess that's because Jake Lehman has just taken his spot as random white wing who makes uh, occasional spot starts. For Connaughton, he's not a 12-team must-add. When Yanni comes back, his shots and his minutes will drop down. He can be a stream guy. He can provide some points and threes on occasion. And that's a pretty nice line. I just don't see that being something that continues. Ersan Ilyasova got into some foul trouble. He started in place of Miritich, who was starting in place of Brogdon, who was starting in place of Yanni or whatever bullshit was going on there. 25 minutes for Ersan, 8 and 7, more of a 16-teamer, while DJ Wilson really stepped it up. Now, the shooting was horrible, 1 of 9, but 6 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists, 3 steals. He's going to be firmly in the rotation for the rest of the season. Should be getting 20-plus minutes a night. So in deeper leagues, with a roster percentage of zero for DJ Wilson, add him in 16s, 18s, 20s, maybe even shallower. Well, Tone Snell started, played 28 minutes, had the toniest Tone Snell line of everyone who's ever toned. Eight and eight with two, two threes, added a random two blocks, couldn't hit his shots. And when everyone is healthy, and by everyone I mean Hill, Brown, Antetokounmpo, Snell might not even be in the rotation. He is just a deeper league guy. For the Cavs, big man Larry Nance was back 7-7-5, seven, seven and five, two steals and two blocks. But importantly, he played 23 minutes while Tristan Thompson played 12. Now, Larry Drew could dick us around, but the fact that Love is now in doubt with his head injury, Nance is a, a solid enough pickup. But be prepared to be disappointed and frustrated. Colin Sexton, the Padawan, another big scoring game. 25 points on 56% shooting. It is excellent. He does nothing else. Three assists, two rebounds, no steals, no blocks. He hit four threes, and the threes are going in at about 7 million percent at the moment, and they are going to drop off. His efficiency is going to drop off, and you're going to be left with an absolute horrible cold streak at some point. But add him. The scoring is good. In a points league, it's working out well. You can get great points, really good efficiency, but know that he will not continue to be a 55% three-point shooter. He will not continue to be this level of scorer. And when those other areas of your game aren't there, that's what leads to wild fluctuations in value. But for now, he's playing really, really well. Massive streak of scoring. It just has such a stench of unsustainability that I worry about it. But you add him and you roll with it. Ante Zizic got the start again, 8-10 and 10 with two blocks, but the return of all these guys puts a cramp on his upper level of value, while Brandon Knight, again, rostered in very few leagues. He's useful in 16-teamers, 13-2-4. and four. I've got the feeling that we're not going to see Matty Dellavedova again this season. That's just a speculation. Well, Osman had 8-3 and three in his 30 minutes. Eh. You, you don't like that. You use that spot better for streaming, but with Love out, maybe it does help him solidify some minutes, but then he struggled in some games without Kevin Love. He's quite a conundrum. He's more of a he's probably more of a guy that you use that spot for streaming rather than hold on in all situations. The next game we look at the Boston Celtics and the Philadelphia 76ers. Al Horford played a lot of minutes, 35, 
22, 6, and 5, but did bang knees late. He's had knee problems all season that caused him to miss that chunk of time earlier in the year. It's absolutely something to watch. With Baines out, it's going to be a little bit harder for them to deal with uh, that situation. If Horford does miss time, they're going to be running Tice, Ojale, and um, and big uh, rock DJ Robbie Williams in that role. But it is one to watch. Irving had 36 and 9, while Rogier played well. 20 points on 50% shooting, only one assist with four triples. He's not reliable. He is just a stream guy. Well, Jason Tatum, over the last two weeks, Tatum has not been a 12-team league guy. Sometimes you have to make hard decisions. 13, 6, and 4 is okay. The shooting's there, but he's not that guy that's been a top 60 guy for the majority of this season. Really struggling at the worst time of the season. And speaking of struggling, Marcus Morris had four points on nine shots. He is reverting back to career Marcus Morris, who in the first 40 games of the season was absolutely a 12-team league guy, but now he's the guy that he's been his entire career. Someone that you just leave on the wire and look at in 14 team. As Marcus Smart got ejected, an inordinate amount of people asking me if he's going to be suspended because of this flagrant two. I would be stunned if if Serge Barker got three games for throwing punches at a bloke, yet blindsiding him from behind after multiple infractions of throwing punches at blokes uh, before. There is, Smart should not get suspended for pushing Embiid in the back, and if he does, that that's that's really poor from the NBA. I'd be I'd be stunned if Smart got suspended here in this one. For the Sixers, Embiid played 41 minutes. He had 37 and 22 with four assists, a triple one, 20 of 21 from the line. Still not enough to be the best line of the night because James Harden exists, but Joel Embiid is playing big minutes. He's putting up big performances, and you know you see he's going to be a top 10, top 8 lock for years to come. He's probably a top 5, top 4 lock for years to come. Benny Simmons, 13, 8, and 7, three steals and two blocks. Filled it up right across the board. Good field goal percentage, good free throw percentage. Strong from him. Well, general soreness, Jimmy Butler came together, came strong late, 22 points. Toby Harris, 21 and 8 in his 37 minutes. Well, Boban, he can't, cannot stay on the court against some of these teams. Five minutes, two points, and we're seeing a lot more prison mic at center. Uh, we didn't see no, uh, well, that was terrible English. We didn't see any Amir Johnson or Jonah Bolden in this game, but Boban, uh, even his deep league value is disappearing. As teams are, you know, they all try it and they go, oh, yeah, we, we want to play Boban every night. He's going to get 18 minutes a night. And he gets out there and they go, yeah, probably probably not. And the Sixers actually stuck with it for longer than anyone else. And yeah, it's uh, it just can't stick. It's simple as that. The Pelicans, they got their asses kicked by the Orlando Magic 119-96. Kendrick Williams, who I don't think had a steal in his first 20 NBA games, is bringing them in bunches now. Another four steals here with seven points and seven rebounds. While Stan Johnson, his best game as a member of the Pelicans, 18 points in 28 minutes. If you haven't seen the Stan Johnson story written before, he does this, and then he will have two points in about four consecutive games. Two steals, three assists, two triples. Looks great. And you go, Stan Johnson, let's go. I know that Kyle McEwen's got a hard-on over it, but I don't think we need to be getting overreactive about this, even though Moore and Holiday are going to miss extended time here. Czech Diallo, who Alvin Gentry made a point of saying, we are going to be playing Czech more minutes. So, of course, with Julius Randle in foul trouble and Anthony Davis out, you play him fewer minutes, because common sense and NBA coaches doesn't always go hand in hand. Diallo had 7 and 11, while Jali Okafor played 29 minutes and had 9 and 8 with 2 blocks. I'd still rather Diallo than Okafor, but that was a confusing decision. While the Alfred Payton March triple-double streak came to an end, 7, 3, and 2. Frankie Jackson, he is what happens when uh, Colin Sexton goes wrong. 14, 4, and 4 on 17 shots. That is why he is a punt field goal guy. He is a point streamer. Not a must roster guy, irrespective of Drew Holiday's rest of season status. For the Magic, Fournier had a good game, but he hasn't had many of those. Shot 69%. Giggity! So that's always a positive. 22 points, but more of a streamer. Vucevic had 15 and 17, while Azza Gordon, 27 and 6, with two steals and a block. DJ Augustin also filled it up, 13, 3 and 7, only 24 minutes. The Magic have only got one more game this week, so I like what Augustin did. I like what Fournier did. I like even what Johnny Isaac did, 8, 10 and 4, with four blocks. Only one game left this week in the remaining four days. You're probably better off streaming those guys. Michael Carter-Williams has the full grasp of the backup point guard role as well. 18 points for him. Uh, sorry, 18 minutes for him. Four and five with two assists, and that does make him a really deeper league guy, but a deeper league guy nonetheless. Now, after that false start earlier, we do go on to the Utah Jazz, killing the New York Knicks, 137-116. The Don, Donovan Mitchell, he was good. He's Don. He's good. 30 points, 5 assists, uh, 5 triples, 
reduced free throw rate, which always happens when it seems when it seems to be when he plays ravishing Rick Rubio and plays with ravishing Rick Rubio. And Rubio himself only 20 minutes, but 12, 3, and 9. His assist numbers are back at a similar level to where they were in Minnesota. And amazingly, he had 10 free throw attempts in this game. Hit all 10 of them. Jingle and Joe was great, 18, 5, and 7 with six triples. Gobert didn't block a shot, but didn't miss a shot either. Uh, Crowder and Favors were solid. It's what happens when you play the Knicks. It's pretty easy to put up good numbers. As for the Knicks, if you don't want to hear me discussing how bad Fisdale is, fast forward. Because this guy continues to make no sense. Kevin Knox, who was struggling with fatigue and was playing poorly, in this game, he played every single minute of the game except for 1 minute 13. 47 minutes on your prized rookie who is struggling through fatigue in a game where you're down by 21 points, is coaching malpractice. Simple as that. Now, Knox played okay in this game. He played well. 27 and 8, 59% shooting, never going to stick at that level. But 47 minutes, you sit for one minute of the game when you've publicly stated that you're worried about fatigue. Man, this bloke, seriously. As for Knox, he's just a deeper league guy. Mario Hazonia, it's a me, another big game. 23 points, 26 minutes, four triples. I wanted Knox and Hazonia to be the starting front court from this team from the preseason. Professor Data didn't agree with me, but we're seeing Hazonia really step it up now. Probably more of a streamer when Vonley comes back. It's anyone's guess what, what Fisdale does here. And of course, Mitchell Robinson. Why wouldn't you play 30 minutes with Mitchell Robinson? Well, he did, finally, after keeping him low in minutes in the previous games. He still had five fouls, so it is possible, David, to play guys with fouls and let them see what they can do. 14 and 12 with three blocks, while DeAndre Jordan, who'd been back at 30 minutes for consecutive games, played 18. You cannot rationalize half this stuff that goes on with Fisdale and the rotations. Jordan, really hard to get a grasp on him. Is he going to be a 30-minute-a-game guy? Is he going to be a 15-minute-a-game guy, 20-minute-a-game guy? The uh, data would tell you that nobody has any idea because it's all over the place. Damo Dotson, after yesterday's, uh, or the day, or game before, Stinkers, 21 points in 37 minutes. Now, that, to be f at least a little bit fair to uh, to Fisdale, Alonzo Trier, Frank Nilakina, Dennis Smith, Kadeem Allen, and Noah Vonley were all out, so extra minutes had to go to other people, no doubt about that. But we honestly didn't need 47 minutes of the uh, Fort Kevin Knox. Moutier had 15, 2, and 5, and with Smith out for the next week, uh, Moutier can be a 12-team stream, but you've got to watch your percentages there. Um, and again, there was no Trier in this game, so Henry Allenson and uh, the Cornetto, Luke Cornett, both got back into the rotation, but they could play 35 minutes next game for all I know with how Fisdale runs things. The Rockets and the Grizzlies, an overtime game, another overtime game. Harden, we talked about already. PJ Tucker, two steals and a block, a defensive streamer type of guy. Iman Shumpert started for Eric Gordon, who rested in this game. Uh, only started the first half because Danny House started the second half. Now, this is what I talked about yesterday with House. What he was doing in those first three games was completely unsustainable. Now, he played 39 minutes here, nine points, three triples, three rebounds, no assists, no steals, no, no, not Noah, no, no assists, no steals, no blocks, three of nine from the field. Everything that he was doing was unsustainable. He's fine as a 16-teamer, but not a guy that you really want touching your 12-teamers. 41 minutes for Chris Paul, 43 minutes for Clint Capella, and they still lost. That's really disappointing for the Rockets. For the Grizzlies, my man Jonas Valanciunas, 33 and 15 in 36 minutes. I have been calling for him to get 30 a night for so, so long. It's finally happening, and it's pretty exciting to see him putting up these numbers. Conley was great, 36, 5, and 8. Well, the corpse of Chandler Parsons is back, 11 and 6, three triples, three steals, 25 minutes for Chandler. Um, Ivan Rab, a guy, you, a young guy you want to develop, he's out of the rotation, worked that one out for me. Uh, Parsons is at least having some deep league value now. Joakim Noah's minutes were down as Valanciunas played through, while Avery Bradley was replaced in the starting lineup by DeLon Wright. And you can look at that and go nine points on nine shots is shit, because it is. But three rebounds, four assists, two steals, just doing the other bits in the other categories that if the shot falls, that becomes a 16-3-4 and four game, maybe a 13-3-4 and four game with two steals. I think that Wright is a 12-team ad in a lot of cases. Justin Holiday, you're doing his best impression of the worst player in the league, eight points in 39 minutes, while Bruno Caboclo played 41, had 15-7-3. Um, again, his minutes are very Fisdalian in that they could be at six minutes as a starter, 40 minutes as a starter, 20 minutes as a starter. He's really, really hard to predict with uh, bigger staff who learnt from the best in Professor Data. The next game we look at, the Wizards lost to the Bulls in an overtime game. Jabari Parker's Colin Sexton-like run continues. 28 points on 61% shooting. 
One steal, two blocks, three threes. He's looked so much better in Washington. The defense still sucks for the majority of it, but he's getting a ton of minutes. He's getting a lot of points. Um, and he's a 12-team league ad at this point. Whether he can stick at this level remains to be seen. This high-efficiency, high-usage run always has the feeling of a pin just hovering over a balloon, and it could really burst in your face, like Larry Markin in February. But strong from him. Uh, Beal had 27-7-7 and with three steals. Saturansky had 16-5-7 and with three steals. While Troy Brown, the man who replaced Trevor Ariza, played 30 minutes. That's 20-plus minutes in three consecutive games for Brownie. 9-10, and 10, strong rebounder, gets some steals. Probably not a 12-team league guy if a reason misses time, but 14s and 16s, yeah, sure. Uh, Punch Bob played 38 minutes, had 15, 5, and 3 with two blocks, smacked uh, Markin and upside the head at one point, was inefficient. I, I do not rate this guy as a player, as you're well aware of, but he still remains a 12-team league guy. For the Bulls, we talked about Markin and we talked about Big Shaq Harrison. Let's talk Chris Dunn, who really took advantage of the fact that Porter and Levine were both out. 39 minutes, 26, 6 and 13 with two steals. Shot the ball poorly from the field and the line. And if you have him in a dynasty league, this is the time, if the trades are still allowed, that you trade him. I don't believe in him as a long-term solution as a point guard. The Bulls would love to get their hands on Ja Morant in the draft. And then Chris Dunn will move into a backup point guard role at some point. And people, there are still plenty of people who believe in Chris Dunn. I was interacting with some of them on Twitter today who think that he's a good player. I don't. I could be wrong on that very easily. I just don't see it. He's already 25 years of age. This is a game that required that extra usage from him. 30% uh, usage is huge for Chris Dunn, and he should never get that in normal, normal circumstances. You still have him. He's still an absolutely a 12-team league guy this season. No debating that whatsoever. I just don't see him long-term. Robin Lopez finally uh, should hit the fan there. Eight points in 31 minutes. Remains a 12-team league guy. And probably the most unbelievable stat on a day where Embiid goes 35 and 20 and Harden drops 57 points. The most unbelievable stat of the whole day is Antonio Blakeney started, played 23 minutes and only took four shots. He is as big a chucker in anyone. Shout out to Jordan Craw Crawford. Um, and he only took four shots. That is, that is amazing to me that uh, Blakeney did that. He started. I thought it would be Ryan Archer, Jackano that would get the start. It wasn't. Uh, so if Levine remains out, it's going to be you know, a bunch of Archer, Jackano and Selden and Lawawu Cabrera, who actually played pretty well here, my man Tim, and, and Blakeney, who fill in uh, that role. But uh, a weird Bulls game and Bulls lineup. The next game up, the Miami Heat and the San Antonio Spurs. Jim Johnson, let's go. Jimmy Johnson, 27 minutes, 13, 5, and 4, two steals and three threes. Only got into the rotation because Justice Winslow got hurt, but with how he is playing, he is going to stick in the rotation. Will he get 27 minutes? Hard to say, unlikely, but that means now that the Kelly Olynyk minutes roller coaster is back in full swing. Only 19 minutes for Olynyk here, and that to me makes him a 12 team drop. It doesn't make Johnson a 12 team ad, but it does make him a deeper league guy, but this is just going to add more confusion. Bam out of bio, big bam bam. Bam, 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 bam. Only the six points, but 15 boards, five assists, two steals. He will be the starting center for this team next season, no doubt about it. He will be close or have the ability to be a top 50 guy next season. I feel pretty confident about that. Whiteside, a, a nice bounce back from him, 12 and 7 in 19 minutes. It is pretty tough to hold on to him at this point in 12-team formats. Well, Joshy Richardson shot better, and when you're shooting 38%, and that means better, that just shows how much of a disaster the other games were. 15, 5, and 4, a steal, two blocks, two threes, really filling it out in those other categories. Dragic, his insane scoring usage efficiency run continues. 32% usage, 62% shooting, 22 points with four threes. It is going to drop. He cannot continue at this level, but he's providing 12-team value. Well, Derek Jones Jr. started, had two blocks, I think he might be the big loser when Winslow comes back. It's going to be him or Johnson, and I think Johnson's been outplaying him these last three games. For the Spurs, everyone's going to want to know what happened with Derek White. Well, it just was a weird Popovich performance or you know, coaching decision. 19 minutes for, for Whitey, 3, 2, and 4. His last couple of games haven't been great. I'm not panicking. I'm still holding. But if you are, again, in do-or-die type situations, and he's your worst or second worst player, you might have to make that move. I still believe in Derek White. I still think it's questionable to give 29 minutes to Bryn Forbes, who remains bad. That's very questionable to me. I understand Paddy Mills. He was on fire. 17 points, 5 triple six assists for Millsy. But I question the decision of Forbes, but I'm not Greg Popovich, so whatever. Derek White, I still think is a hold. Yucca Pertle, not. 
two points, 14 minutes. Rudy Gay was excellent, 15, 8, and 7. There'll be ups and downs with both of those guys. I would rather Gay over Pirtle in most spots. Pirtle is a streamer for some field goal percentage, even though that didn't come here. Rebounds and blocks, not a must roster player. Aldridge was great, 17 and 9. DeRozan, 17, 15, and 6. And DeMar DeRozan getting 15 rebounds is uh, almost as unbelievable as Antonio Blakeney taking only four shots. The next game, the Raptors beat the Thunder in overtime, the third overtime game of the day, 123, 114. Pascal Siakam, 33, 13, and 6. Two steals and one block in 43 minutes. The only bad thing about Siakam's season this year is we've worked, we've heard that his name is uh, nickname is P-Skills or Spicy P, two of the worst nicknames in the NBA. And I know because I deliver quite a few bad nicknames. That is horrible, but his performances was great. Uh, Dan Green, we talked about already. Freddie Van Vliet, 23, 6 assists, 2 steals, 40 minutes. Jeremy Lin is struggling that much that I could see Lin almost being out of the rotation when Lowry returns. And that's going to give Van Vliet 12 team value. So while Lowry's out, you add him, you hold him, and you see what happens. I reckon instead of 21 minutes a night that he was getting when DeLon was there, I reckon he's a 25, 26 guy, and that's enough. Mark Gasol. Oh, hi, Mark. Him and Serge Ibaka, it was a 25-23 minute split at the end of regulation. And that meant that yeah, it's pretty hard to roster Gasol. But he played all of the minutes in overtime to get him up to 30. So it's a little bit misleading to look at this box score and say, well, Mark Gasol played 30, therefore I'm holding him. Because again, it was only 25 at the end of regulation. It says something that he did play all of overtime. I think he's going to get the bulk of the minutes on this team at center for a lot of the games. But it's going to be 25-23, 26-22, not 30-18. So I think Gasol and Ibaka, if you're looking for that open roster spot, I think they're both got to be at least considered droppable players, while the fun guy had 22, 10, and 6 with two steals. Siakam, Green, Van Vliet, and Leonard all had two steals in this game. For the Thunder, Russell Westbrook was back from suspension, 42, 11, and 6. Hit five threes amazingly on 10 attempts. You're not going to get that from Russell that often. While Paul George fouled out, not his greatest night, 19, 5, and 6, and struggled from both the field and the line. Only four points for Steve Adams. Disappointing. Dennis Schroeder, 12-7-4 with horrible efficiency. He can be a 12-team league guy, but he's not a must-roster guy. Well, Jeremy Grant, uh, again, took did his best Westbrook impression. Nine points on 14 shots, but the 14 boards, the block, I would rather have him over Schroeder in a lot of cases. It just depends on what you need, and that's really what you've got to be focusing on at this point in the fantasy season. Nerlens Noel returned from his one-game absence to uh, get that back up center minutes back. The last game of the night was a pretty comfortable Portland victory, 126-118, that the Mavericks came back late. Doncic only 29 minutes, 24-5 and 6, while the burner, Jalen Brunson, 16-2-3, remains a must-roster 12-team league guy. Only 26 minutes for Dwight Powell, 24 minutes for Tim Hardaway because they benched these starters and then the bench got them back in at the end. This was a blowout because Costa Antetokounmpo played his first NBA game. Ryan Brokoff played five minutes. Um, and Courtney Lee played 15. With Maxi Kleber out, we saw Justin Jackson play 34 minutes. He had 21 points on high efficiency. He does nothing else, and we know that he'll do this one out of every eight games. Even if Kleber remains out for Thursday, I wouldn't get overly excited about Justin Jackson. For the Blazers, Lillard really stepped it up again with CJ out, 33-5-12, and 12, while Flamin Mo Harkless, he had a Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. Two threes, two steals, two blocks. He's a defensive defensive specialist who's picking it up at the right time of the year and he's a 12-team league guy. Seth Curry, the biggest beneficiary from CJ's uh, absence outside of Lillard. 20 points with four triples. He's a points and threes stream option in 12-teamers. Rocket Rodney Hood remains the same shitful, inconsistent guy while Jake Lehman started and had 13 points with three threes. They are 14 or probably even 16-team league guys. Cantor did well in his 20 minutes, 14 and 10, but nothing to get overly interested in with him. While the chief, Al Farouk Aminu, yesterday he was good. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Today, he was shit. And I don't think anybody would be surprised to have that uh, occur, because that's just who he is. Let's talk some DFS now as we go into Tuesday's, or sorry, Thursday's games. Look back at Wednesday's perfect lineup on DraftKings. Chris Dunn, Dan Green, The Fort, Kevin Knox, Larry Markin, and Mitchie Robinson, Jimmy Harden, Pascal Siakam, and Jonas Valanciunas for a total of 445.5, and that cost the full 50000 And on Fangel, Bledsoe, Dunny, Harden, Dan Green, Kevin Knox, Jabari Parker, Larry Markin, and Pascal Siakam, and Jali Lokafor for a total of 435.2, and that cost $59,500. All right, guys, let's look at DFS now for Thursday. There are six games on across the NBA. We're going to be focusing mainly on fan jewel pricing for today's slate of games. The first game we look at is the Minnesota Timberwolves at the Charlotte Hornets. No spread or total released at this point. Uh, Jeff Teague is out. 
My name is Jeff. Bob Covington is out. Derek Rose is out. We know all those guys. Taj Gibson is still questionable. While on the Charlotte side of things, Cody Zeller is doubtful. Absolutely zero chance that he plays, I'd say. While Tone Parker rested last game, he should be back in action for the Hornets here. At point guard, Tyus Jones is at 5,300. He hasn't been wowing us, but he's still providing 25, 26 points, which is 5x value. And I think that that's strong enough for cash with having pretty limited upside. Kemba Walker's at 9,300. Quietly, going up against the Timberwolves has been an excellent matchup for point guards. Kemba had a foul-plagued game against the Sixers where he still put up 35 points, but I think he's got 50-point upside here. I really like him for tournaments, and I don't think it's actually a bad cash option as well. Parker and Jared Bayless, they're not going to do it. At shooting guard, Andy Wiggins, 6,600. 40 points last game, 41 minutes. It took a lot of shots to get there, a lot of minutes to get there, but he got there. I don't mind this one here for Wiggins. I think he's reasonably priced on a fairly aggressively priced slate overall, while Josh Okoge is at 4,300. The last two games, he's been unbelievable, putting up big minutes, big shot attempts, and big uh, shooting efficiency numbers. Whether that continues to, remains to be seen, but with a bunch of guys out in that backcourt, Akogi has that ability, and as a GPP option, he's clearly there. While uh, Jeremy Lamb at 7,000, he is crushing that almost every night at the moment, averaging close to 40 points across the last three games. Feel like a solid enough cash play. That's some, uh, small forward Nicky Batum has done really well against the Wolves in the past, averaging 41 the last three meetings. His recent production uh, in general has been down with a 26-point average over the last five, and the last three have been even worse than that. I think a bounce back comes from Batum. I wouldn't feel 100% safe in locking him in in cash, but I also don't think that it's the worst option out there. Uh, the Baconator, Dwayne Bacon, getting a lot of minutes, not doing much. Same with Miles Bridges, although to be fair to Bridges, 29 points in 29 minutes last game is a positive. Michael Kidd-Gilchrist has been ruled out of this one as well for the Hornets, so that might boost uh, Miles Bridges' numbers, or minutes at least. I still don't feel super interested in using him. Frank the Tank Kaminsky at 4,700. We know he's getting minutes. We know he's doing absolutely nothing else apart from score. And that's not translating into great DFS value, averaging just 21 over the last five. And at 4,700, it's not really enough. And he doesn't have the peripheral numbers in his game to make him a, an excellent play. Sharich is at 4,000. Maybe if Taj is ruled out, we'd have a look there. Marvin Williams, no thanks. Taj Gibson also is a pretty big no thanks. At center, Townsie, 11,500. We know how good it is for opponent. Uh, opposing centers to go up against Charlotte. Towns is one of the best regardless. If he got 70 here, I wouldn't be stunned. I wouldn't predict it, but I wouldn't be stunned. I think getting 60 is probably realistic for Towns here. Love it. Bismack Biombo, that's going to be a no from me. While Bill Hernan Gomez, maybe he sees some minutes with Kid Gilchrist out, but even then, I don't think we really need to pay too much attention in that direction. On DraftKings, you love Towns. Kemba at 81 looks great. Wigo at 58. I think that's actually pretty solid. Batum all the way down at 5,000 and averaging 42 points on DraftKings the last three times against Minnesota. I feel a turnaround comes, and that's a really, really good price for him. Akogi at 3,900 I also like quite a bit over on DraftKings, and Lamb at 65 is a solid, solid, solid cash option. Next up, the Denver Nuggets and the Washington Wizards. The Nuggets are 6.5-point favorites, and the total is 228.5. The Wizards are on a back-to-back, -back, and overtime back-to-back -back nonetheless. You've got Punch Bob Shiploke versus Nikola Jokic. I'm not sure Portis is really going to be able to shut down Jokic at all. Trevor Ariza strained his groin for the Wizards on uh, Wednesday. I would be absolutely flabbergasted if he plays in this one. They're calling him day-to-day, -day, but this is literally the next day, so I don't think we're going to have Trevor Ariza play. That means that Troy Brown will likely start and play 30 plus minutes. It boosts Jabari Parker. It boosts Jeff Green as well. My name is Jeff. And if you want to get really wild, Wes Johnson got some minutes in Wednesday's action. At point guard, the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray, 6,900. Giggity! Has been a little bit under on his recent performances. I'll probably end up fading off him here, while uh, Thomas Satoransky also at 6,900. Giggity! I'd be way more interested in using Murray than Satoransky at that sort of a salary. It just, it just is way too high. At shooting guard, Monty Morris at 4,300. I think there's something there in Morris. Last game, just 19 points, but 19 minutes, because we had to have the Isaiah Thomas tribute seven minutes. Those seven minutes would normally go to Monty. I think he can push back to the 24. 26 point range here so I like him as an option while Beal 10,300 on a back-to-back -back after an overtime and at, at a, an above $10,000 price tag it worries me a little bit here with Beal 
Malik Beasley, Chase and Randall, I don't see it for them. Troy Brown, I do. Minimum salary for Brownie. Um, yeah, you'd have to think he's getting 30-plus minutes. Now, if Reza plays, that takes a bit away from Brown, but he's played 20-plus minutes in three consecutive games. He's rebounding well. He can get assists. We're not really seeing that at this point in his career. I think that might be a third-year trait that comes out in Troy Brown's game, but strong rebounding, good steals, extra opportunity, minimum salary. Really like Troy Brown here. Well, Jabari Parker, it just doesn't stop for Jabari. 6,700 continues to score, continues to get a lot of minutes, continues to be really efficient, and it's very hard to ignore him at that sort of a salary. Jeff Green at 46 is more of a tournament guy. Farton, Will Barton at 55, the same. And Gaz Harris listed as a small forward for God knows what reason. 4,700 for Gaza. He was okay last game for the Nuggets, but realistically, him and Barton are just tournament guys. For the power forwards, Punch Bob, the starting center, of course, he's a power forward. 5,600 had been really poor up until the Bulls game where he got a bunch of extra minutes in that overtime. At 5,600, I look at him more as a tournament guy because it really could go either way. While Paul Millsap at 7,500, love what Millsap's been doing. The matchup is a strong one for Paul. Um, yeah, I don't mind him for cash. I think he's got limited tournament upside though. For the centers, Jokic is at 10,100. It's pretty good. It's pretty, 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 pretty good. He took over in the Nuggets last game, had 59 points, and you know, getting 60 against this Wizards team would not be a stunner at all for Jokic, who would do allow, in general, opposing centers to go pretty big. 4,700 for Mason Plumlee. Thomas Bryant, not interested in either of those blokes. On DraftKings, we're looking at Troy Brown at 3,100. That is a, a great, great opportunity for him. Jabari looks great. Jokic, Murray, Millsap, Beal at 9,200. Still has appeal on DraftKings, at least significantly more than he has on FanDuel. Let's go on to the third game of the day. It's the Utah Jazz on a back-to-back -back as well. They're back-to-back, -back not quite as taxing as what the Wizards one was with a about 720-point you know, victory over the Knicks. They travel to Atlanta to take on the Hawks. The Jazz are favored by seven, and the total is 226.5, a great guard matchup going up against the Hawks. Trey Young does allow opposing... Um, Opposing guards to, in general, put up pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, numbers uh, against them. If we look at this uh, over on the FanDuel site, at point guard, Trey Young is at 7,600. I actually really, really like that for Trey. He had 46 earlier this season against the Jazz. He's been a consistent 35-36 point guy. I like this for Trey Young quite a bit. While ravishing Rick Rubio is at 6,600. And if the salary was actually reasonable, I'd like Rubio. He's giving us 30 a night over the last three. He's a sister at Minnesota Rubio level numbers. But at 6,600, I, I just don't see it. At shooting guard, Bazemore's at 31. Just a GPP option. Same with Fanta Pants, Kevin Herter. While the Don, Donovan Mitchell. He's Don. He's good. He's at 8,800. He... He put it to the Knicks pretty comfortably. 41 points in 29 minutes. An excellent matchup here for the Don. Um, the price is maybe too high, but I don't completely hate it. At small forward, the artist formerly known as Torian Prince is down at 4,700. So I'm still going to get sucked into him as a tournament guy, but that's it. Bembry, probably the same for a tournament. That's really it with him. Well, Jingle and Joe, love what he's doing. Not bad cash value at 6,200, but probably yeah, limited upside. Crowder and O'Neal, they're not going to do it. At power forward, the Baptist, John Collins. He's been about a 35, 36-point guy the last three games. The matchup's quite a tough one, so this might be a bit of fade territory here for Collins. While Derek Favors is a little bit too highly priced at 67. Rudy Gobert at 9,400. Um, a bit limited against the Knicks because of the low minutes to be expected in such a blowout. But prior to that, he was giving us 40 a night comfortably. I think that might be a bit high for Gobert. His opposing guy, Dwayne Dedman, the Undertaker, 5,600, has been you know, pretty solidly in that sort of price range for big chunks of this season. So I don't, uh, I don't dislike him here. I think there's um, some good value in the Undertaker at 5,600. Not really feeling too much about Alex Len though. On DraftKings, The Undertaker again, 53. Rubio at 52, a much more reasonable price, and I like that quite a bit. Trey Young at 75, also strong. Uh, Donovan Mitchell at 82, looks pretty good. And Derek Favors is a much more palatable 5,300. I think he's actually in the, in the discussion to be a cash guy over on DraftKings. Next up, you've got the Detroit Pistons traveling to take on the Phoenix Suns. The John Lua revenge game tour continues. 
The Pistons are seven-point favourites. The total, 218.5. Kelly Oubre and Tyler Johnson and, of course, Tony Warren Jr. are all out for the Suns. And I do have my worries, as I mentioned earlier, about these guys playing again uh, or decently uh, this season. At point guard, De'Anthony Melton's at 3,600. What will Kokoshkov do? What will he do with his minutes? But at 3,600, he's got 30-point upside, so he's got to be in your GPP pool. He's just not a high fantasy point producer in general. Reggie Jackson's at 55. The minutes have been a little bit worrying for Jacko, so I'd probably fade off with him. Jamal Crawford, Luke Kennard as shooting guards, they're not going to do it. The shooting guard we want to look at is Devin Booker, but he's all the way at 9,500. He's averaging 50 over the last five, but the Pistons consistently this season have been a team that has limited opposing shooting guards. So Booker, while I think his floor is really strong and that gives him cash appeal, He's not in the best spot of the season, but still, it's not a bad situation. The Duke, Wayne Ellington, with Blake Griffin out last time, had 32 in 32. The minutes, the opportunities, the shot attempts, they won't be the same for Ellington, so we're not going to bank on that repeating. While McCall Bridges at 4,900, he's probably going to start. He's averaging 39 minutes over the last three games, only 19 points, but 39 minutes. Um, with Fangel's ability to really get those multipliers going on steals and blocks, it gives him uh, upside for GPPs at 4,900 that he could have 35 points, but I still don't see a great utility in him. I do like Joshy Jackson at 5,400, just the amount of guys out, his ability to jack up shots, he should be getting you to 30 points here, so I think he's got great value. While Blake Griffin, down at 8,400, should really be able to take apart this Suns front court. So I like Blake after managing his load last game. I'm not tired. At center, Andre Drummond's at 10,900. Normally, I'd think that's too high, but going up against the Suns and DeAndre Ayton, I'm in on it. On the flip side, Ayton's at 8,000. He's putting up some big, big numbers. His backup, Rashawn Holmes, is questionable. Ayton had 61 last game, and he had 50 in the earlier game against the Pistons this season. So I think at 8,000, he is in play. Thon McCare started last game for Griffo. He'll move to the bench, and at 3,800, I don't really see any appeal there. On DraftKings, the Duck Luke Kennard is a GPP guy. Uh, has played well against Phoenix in the past, but not, not super into him. Like Josh Jackson a lot, like Drummond a lot, like Griffo a lot. Uh, like Aiton at 69. Giggity. Quite a bit as well. And Booker at 88, one of the best cash options on the slate. The next game we take a look at here, the Dallas Mavericks on a back-to-back -back against the Sacramento Kings. The Kings are eight and a half point favorites. The total here is 229. This will be uh, Harrison Barnes, the pencil against his former team. <laughs> The Kings are favorite eight and a half, as I mentioned as well. Uh, I think I already mentioned that. Marvin Bagley on a massive roll at the moment, and he has a big positive matchup. I'd love to see that they go with him and Bielitsa as that really big minute front court combo. Cauley Stein could jack that up though, but it is something for us uh, for us to pay attention to here. At point guard, De'Aaron Foxy Fox, great matchup, 8,500. Balls to the wall player, 40 points, should be a decent expectation. While the burner, Jalen Brunson, a bit disappointing last game, but when you disappoint and still put up 27 and your salary is only 6,100, I like it, and I don't see how you couldn't like it, really. At shooting guard, Budrick Heald was also pretty disappointing in the blowout, or not blowout, in the uh, blown lead against the Nets, 7,000. His recent numbers have been a little bit too uh, down. Um, I think Bud gets back on track here, and I do actually think he's worth a look. Bogdanovich, I'm not interested in. Timmy Hardaway at 53, I like for tournaments. And then Luka Doncic is all the way at 10,000. He's giving us high 40s almost every night, so really good cash play. Uh, Bielitz is at 5,000. That's too high for his you know, limited consistency. While the Pencil's at 5,800, more of a cash guy than a tournament player. Finney Smith, Brewer, Justin Jackson, they're all going to be no's from me. Marvin Bagley's at 66. He had 33 points. Well, he's averaging, sorry, 33 over the last three games in only 23 minutes. The minutes should be pushing up close to 30. I like him quite significantly here. Dwight Powell at 6,900. Giggity. Probably a little bit too high here for Powell at that salary. He's got massively strong floor, just not high enough of a ceiling. Uh, Gilesy, Durkey. Uh, Maxi Kleber, who I really doubt will play, he sat out the uh, Wednesday's game. I doubt that uh, Kleber will play in this one. Uh, for the centers, Corley Steins at 55. You know, I don't. He had he played 19 minutes last game, had 27 points. I don't really see if you're going to use him, it's going to be for tournaments, but that's really about it. While Salah Mejri, yeah, I don't really see much in him either. On DraftKings, a lot I like here. Fox, Bagley, Powell, Heald, Doncic, Barnes. I think all of these guys have value in both formats of DFS. Jalen Brunson, probably less favorable on DraftKings than what he is on Fangio. 
And then we go to the last game of the night, the Indiana Pacers and the Golden State Warriors. In Golden State, the Warriors are 11-point favorites, and the total is 220 and a half. Uh, Darren Collison has been officially listed as questionable. I, I really don't think that Darren is going to play. DeMarcus Cousins is likely to return, while Sean Livingston, who sat out last game, could return. Not sure if the Warriors are going to rest anyone. This is their third of their five games this week. We'll see if anything does happen there. At point guard, Collison's at 66. It's too high, regardless if he's going to play or not. Steph's at 98, really putting it together the last three games. But with Boogie coming back, I think this might make him a fade guy. And if Collison is out, Corey Joseph is a tournament player. Player, and same as uh, Tyreek Evans, both uh, who do have that upside. Evans is significantly higher upside, though. At shooting guard, Wesley Matthews, Clay Thompson. I think Clay, uh, oh, I know Clay has been giving us 40 a night. I just think 8,200 takes away a lot of his value. At small forward, I like that Durant is down at 9,300, but he's down there for a reason. He's averaging only 34 points over the last five in 34 minutes, not really himself. And if Cousins is back, it does take some shots away. I would go back to him one more time, but it's it's been a little bit worrisome, the lack of production from KD. And then you go to the big man, Draymond's at 7,200, whose recent production has been up, but I think Cousins' return puts a bit of a dampener on him. Thad Young also struggling, but historically good against Golden State. I don't mind him for cash, but nothing more. Sabonis at 64, I think that's too high for me. And then for the centers, Looney and Bogut, we're going to fade those guys. Miles Turner up all the way at 7,900, who has been playing well and centers have done well against the Warriors. He hasn't been one of them in the past. Um, not super interested in him. While Cousins is at 86, a good opportunity for Boog, but I still think that salary is probably just a little bit too high. On DraftKings, Cousins at 6,800, way more appealing, massively into him on DraftKings. Miles Turner, similarly, 6,400, happy to use both of those guys here. Same with Clay Thompson. The, the salary changes in those three guys make them very appealing DraftKings options. Let's look at some stud and value type options. On DraftKings, I'm going for a stud of Towns and a value play of Joshy Jackson. On Fangio, my stud is Jokic, and my value is Josh Jackson. Of course, Troy Brown could be a value play in all of these sites as well. On Yahoo, my stud is Jokic, and the value play is Monty Morris minimum salary. Again, Troy Brown, another guy you can keep in as all those value plays with the assumption that Ariza is out. Make sure... Now, you guys are subscribing to this podcast, and you can also find our podcast on the new app for podcasting, Himalaya. So go to Himalaya, download it, and find the Locked On podcast, this one and all of the others, uh, as well as all the usual spots that you find your podcast. Give it all a big shout out. Give it a thumbs up uh, on YouTube. Uh, subscribe, hit the bell, all that sort of stuff. But make sure you are checking us out with our new uh, supporter, Himalaya, which is a, a new podcasting app. Download that app and find your Locked On podcast shows right across that network Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.